peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our next hymn.
please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Reading once again our Old Testament lesson. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleamings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall, not do, no in, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor, defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slander among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A quick reading of our text today. If you just read it quickly, you might think this to yourself. Man, that's just more commandments from God, and he said, oh, I'm the big boss, you better do what I want you to do, or Shh. maybe we just assume that's what he's saying, but that's not really there. That's a poor understanding of the text, if you just hear that and say, ah, just more commandments, who reads the Old Testament anyways? God is just simply not saying, I'm the mighty God and you better do what I say. He is saying something much more relational, much more loving. What I mean by that is this, and I'm sure all the members of my Bible classes say, are, are saying, oh boy, Pastor, we've heard that a million, t million times. But every time you see the word Lord capitalized in your Bible translation and it's capitalized with all the letters, you know originally that's not what it said. It did not say the Lord. It said God's personal name in the scriptures, Yahweh. So God is giving his personal relationship here, his personal name to his people, 
the very people that he saved. He revealed himself to their father, Abraham. And then years later, when they were slaves to Pharaoh, he freed them. And he brought them, he was about to bring them into a promised land filled with milk and honey. These are the things that God did for the people that he made. And as he had declared, he declares later in the Old Testament, you are my treasured possession. You are the work of my hands. And we sang that during Vacation Bible School this year. But this is a relational thing. You have a relationship with me. I am Yahweh. I am your God. I am your Savior. Don't do things the way they did back in Egypt. That's not how my people are to be. That's not acting like my treasured possession. Don't do how the Canaanites lived. Do what's consistent with me and who I am. Follow my will. That is what God is saying in our text today. Now, what does he exactly tell his people to do? Well, he tells his people to love your neighbor. And it's interesting, who is the neighbor? The neighbor can even include the stranger who is in Israel. Strangers could not own any property in Israel because that was the heritage only of the people of God. But still, they were supposed to look out for those guys. So what were they supposed to do? Well, if you have a field, don't harvest it all the way to the end. Leave the edges for people who need food so they can eat from it. That's the way you will love your neighbor in Israel. And going forward, that's also a way that we know that they could love their fellow Israelites, especially widows and orphans. That's one of the ways that they could obtain food. And you know when you are harvesting and you accidentally drop some fruit or some vegetables on the ground, some wheat, don't pick it up. Leave it on the ground. One of your fellow Israelites or maybe one of the strangers in our community will pick it up and eat it. Love your neighbor. Even if that neighbor is a stranger, love your neighbor. Some of these things are so applicable even today. Don't be cruel to people with disabilities. Did you hear what he said? Don't put any rocks in front of a person who's blind. Don't curse at a person who can't hear. That kind of cruel stuff is not supposed to be done. That's not how God is, and that's not how he wants his people to be. Doesn't make a joke at another person's expense who has a disability. There's that odd saying in there that says, you better pay your workers, don't keep the payment overnight. What is he saying by that? He is saying, pay your workers promptly, especially back then where if you didn't get paid for the day, you probably wouldn't have food for the night. Pay your workers promptly. That's how you can love your neighbor. And so when we see this text in here, you should see two things. One, a relationship with God, and two, a relationship with the neighbor. But the way God presents it, they blend into one thing. Relationship with God, relationship with neighbor. That's how the people of God are to be. Both guns firing. And I say this today because recently I was touched by a little story, and it's really not a story. It's something that I experienced at my son's graduation party. One parent started talking to me. The parent has children ages 21 to 30, and the children have all left the church. And what was interesting to me is that they said, you know, our only hope is that, you know, every time our children have problems, they say, Mom and Dad, can you please pray for us? What's sad about that is that they don't have a personal relationship with God. At least it doesn't sound like it. Are they praying? I doubt it. It seems like they're only asking mom and dad to pray for them. See, if you have a personal relationship with God, it's like just like that if you have a personal relationship with another person. Say, for example, your wife. 
If you have a wife, are you going to talk with them? I hope so. If you have a wife, are you going to try to be with them? I hope so. If you have a wife, are you going to listen to them? If you don't do any of these three things, you're acting as if you don't have a wife. And if you are not coming to be in God's presence in worship service, if you are not coming to hear what his word says, if you are not speaking to him day by day, this does not sound like having a relationship with God. Now, what has bothered me right now is that I'm saying this, and my whole ministry, I've poo-pooed having a personal relationship with God. But after this parent told me this story, I'm thinking, wow, I guess that needs to be said. A personal relationship with God means that you are in contact with God, you are listening to God, you are speaking to God, and when you have the opportunity to be in God's presence in a special way, you are taking advantage of that. That's relational. And I just fear that these kids have lost their relation with God. And what's a sad thing is that some people might say, well, it's because they weren't treated right as youth. They probably didn't have a youth group. No, they had a pretty strong youth group. Well, did you make sure their lives were fun? Well, the youth group had their own youth building. And inside the building was the coolest video game I've ever seen, where you're riding on a motorcycle in front of a screen. Well, maybe their worship wasn't cool enough and hip enough. No, these kids were all in the praise band. What seems to have happened is now their lives have become about themselves and their personal other, their girlfriend or boyfriend or wife or husband. And it seems like nobody else really, they don't have any time for anything else except these two people in their lives. But that relate, they might have a relationship with someone else, but that someone is not God. What I was saying earlier that I've been poo-pooing personal relationship with God, that's because my whole life, that's all I heard. Do you have a personal relationship with God? Do you have a personal relationship with God? So now you have another problem where people are focused only on their personal relationship with God. Well, I don't need the church. It's me and God. And I'm afraid that this even up the ante during COVID. Well, I can just watch on the computer, okay? And now that we can get together, people aren't even coming back. Well, I'm just fine. Just me and God. I pray to him every day. And, you know, when I need him, I'll need him. It's me and God. That's good. But here's the thing. If you don't have, if you don't have this, you don't really have this. What I'm saying here is that you can't separate the two. There's this vertical relationship with God with Jesus Christ, but then what, if you read the scriptures, what do you also have? You have this horizontal relationship with Christ's body on earth, the church. And you also have a relationship with others outside the church because God asks us to love our neighbor. And as that guy learned when he talked to Jesus about who is his neighbor, wow, that term is pretty elastic. This is good, but if this is bad, I'm afraid this is going to be bad too. The two things are together. You know, if you have peanut butter, but no chocolate, you don't have a Reese's peanut butter cup. And if you have chocolate and no peanut butter, you don't have a Reese's peanut butter cup. And if you don't have Jesus and neighbor, you don't have Christianity. But people are trying to get rid of these things. Oh, mom and dad, you pray for me. I don't want a relationship with God, but I'll live off of yours. Oh, I love Jesus, but I don't have to care about the rest of the people. It's just me and God. That's not Christianity. If you have a relationship with God, you have a relationship with his people. If you have his relationship with the people, you must have a relationship with God. 
these things go together even better than a Reese's peanut butter cup. And if you start to play games that no, those two things don't go together, I make my own way, that's what you're doing. You're making your own not way. And you're not walking in God's ways. But Yahweh, the Lord, says, I am your Lord. I am your Savior. And the stuff that he tells us, that's stuff that we strive for. Why? Because we do have a relationship with God. And we do love him. But how can we love him? We can't reach up and give him a hug. But we can't hug our neighbors. We can't love our neighbors. Christianity is two things merged into one. Love for God, love for neighbor. It's two things into one. I believe totally that I'm saved in grace through faith, and my faith only clings to Jesus for my salvation. But with faith's other hand, I'm always reaching out to my neighbor. That's what Christianity is. Jesus Christ came and loved us so we can be loving. We're loving because he first loved us. These two things go together. What God has put together, let people not separate. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.